chat about um, what you guys yeah. are going to chat about. So, I, I think that's good indeed, uh, Jim. So, so we're going to catch up with uh, Chris Abbott. Some of you that uh, are you know, visiting some of these other live events may remember that David and myself did an interview with uh, Chris, uh, what was it, last year, I think, David? World of Commodore, yeah. Yeah, at World of uh, Commodore. I'm starting to mix up all these, these events. And that was, it was really, really cool. So we're very excited to have him back this year. Chris got quite a bit of new stuff on his plate. And, uh, you know, knowing Chris, he'll, uh, he'll be able to go into quite a bit of detail. And uh, we're going to put him to the test a little bit today as well. And uh, unlike, unlike me, I've actually been prepping a couple of questions. Oh. And some of that has got to do with the uh, with the with the book that uh, that this presentation or this interview was named after uh, that is uh, available for pre-order, and uh, I had a chance to uh, peek a little bit inside of that book already, and it's covering a lot of the arcade era, and I am a big arcade fan, so I've uh, I've definitely got a questions uh, questions lined up for uh, for Chris. Now I see I, I see a Chris Abbott window. Do we have Chris here along with your name? I think entirely possible. Oh, uh, there, there we go. Yuri, you have the helm. <laughs> okay, excellent. Chris, thanks a lot for making it again. I think it must be about what uh, eleven in the evening UK time. Yes, yes, I'm I'm sleepy. Should we be worried and uh, get you some coffee, or are you going to be all right? Oh, just don't play any sweet triangle waves. I might, I might go. <laughs> good, good. Hey, Chris, uh, thanks a lot for making time for us again. Last year at uh, World of Commodore, we, uh, we had a great time uh, getting to learn a little bit about the projects that you were working on, things that uh, you've got still up your sleeve. And really what we're going to try and do today, if we're, if, with your permission, is try and pick it up from there, especially talk a little bit about... Uh, well, the book that's coming out, which is only a first out of a longer series of books. Um, wh why don't we give you a few minutes to just, A, do a quick introduction for those people, those few people that don't know you yet, or uh, have not heard of you, and then maybe uh, talk a little bit about the book as well, and we'll pick it up from there. Um, I'm Chris Abbott. I've been remixing Commodore 64 music since 1994. Um, I produce CDs, live events, concerts, and uh, look after uh, some of the composers as well. Um, this, I've, I've changed direction slightly to widen outside the SID in the last uh, year or two since the pandemic hit. And here we are. Um, okay, so while well, the, the uh, slightly outside is the understatement of the year, I'd say. Uh, given the given the book series that you're working on, uh, so so tell us a little bit about what 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 you were set out to do and what that has now become. Well, during the the first lockdown in in May 2000, um, I was going through my hard disk and I came across some um, some starts to remixes of arcade tunes. Uh, Outrun um, was the the main one. And uh, I thought, hmm, okay, I've, uh, that was 1997 I'd done those. So I thought, yeah, I, I can improve on these. And before I knew it, I'd actually produced, um, uh, had some great fun remixing Sega tunes for um, uh, a remix album called Arcade Classics Volume 1, which is on Spotify now. And so that's Outrun, Afterburner, Power Drift, a um, bit of the Space Harry music. And uh, during that time, I got to know the um, original soundtracks um, from not only that, but some of the economy stuff and got interested in um, what they were doing, what chips were in there. And um, then I was talking to, in a chat about that sort of thing, to my collaborator, Andrew Lagan. And uh, suddenly I made a joke about, uh, oh, we should write the little book of sound chips because there'd been a little book of Spectrum games. And of course, there's... Above that, there's the little book of calm, which is which is a um, there's all sorts of little books, and um, and then suddenly we realised well actually uh, we could actually do that, and that would be quite interesting. Um, part of part of it also was in uh, the tail end of Project Hubbard, mm -hmm. where uh, obviously Rob Hubbard worked mostly on the SID, but he did a lot of work on the Mega Drive, 
and he did a lot of work on the tan well not a lot of work but he did some work on the tandy that had the the three voice chip and, and um also got into roland mt32 and uh, sound blaster apl3 and um so in sort of collating all that together um it gave me a feel for well there's um a much bigger world outside of Sid, especially also listening to so listening to some of the Nintendo stuff, the NES stuff, um, because the, uh, the and the stuff that used that fairly unique chip, and also that what what puzzled me was why you why UK composers and European composers hadn't particularly made any splash in Japan and vice versa, except for very obvious uh, differences like. Um, uh, Yuzo, uh, who did Streets of Rage and uh, and uh, Koji Kondo, of course, and um, and uh, the the uh, a, a, a very few Japanese composers came one way, and very few European composers went the other. And I wanted to know why. And there's actually a, a recently good article about it in Volume Two, but it comes down to the fact of the way people entered the industry. And what they were taught and what the expectations were so in the uk you could just turn up at a turn up at a software house with a demo disc and uh, and the, the ceo will go yeah okay here's 50 quid go away and do something in japan you had to come through university and form will have formal qualifications as a rule and so the uh, everyone came to it with kind of like a music theory classical background which meant that quite often you got things which were not pushing the boundaries technically um, until later on some uh, some composers did like like Yuzo. Um, and Tim Follin was the main crossover mm -hmm. because uh, he 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 was uh, like a legendary god on the NES even though they, they're kind of annoyed that he, he doesn't like his own chip music or chips in general. <laughs> He's legendarily snotty about his, um, about his own accomplishments and how much he hated doing the tunes. Right. He liked us slightly more, but I, I have a great respect for the Nest sound chip. It did a, a lot of things quirkily and a couple of things that hadn't been done before, like, um, like PCM samples straight on the chip. Right. So, um, your Not little suspect. book, your little book of sound chips didn't stay little, did it? it it's little because it's fifteen centimeters by fifteen centimeters. Um, in inches, I think that makes it about uh, six or seven inches right. each way. Yep. So that's around the size of a seven inch, slightly smaller than a seven inch single. How, how many pages was uh, is volume one now? Um, it's three hundred and twenty four. 324 volume, pages. Yeah, vo volume two has Sid and Amiga in it, so that jumped up to like 420 pages. Oh my goodness! But the thing is, it's it's not it's not like 420 pages of text. If, if I took all of the write-ups for the chips, which tend to be between one and four pages, then you would have um, a fairly chunky, fairly dense one-volume, 300-page book. Right. Um, but what uh, the most um, it, it, uh, I wrote it that way originally, in fact. And then when when I gave the manuscript to people to look through, um, they couldn't be bothered because it they were like three hundred pages, and then it's like you know dense text. Yeah, it's not that dense. It's it's pretty it's pretty accessibly written right. because it's it's written. It, it's not from an academic point of view. It's written to tell stories, to tell right. stories about about um, how the chip was developed technically, any business interest or composer interest or how people use the chip. Or uh, Most of the chips, th there was a different story to tell. Some of them were weird chips that had been put in home organs that suddenly appeared in arcade machines. Right. Um, to good effect in a couple of, a couple of them. Uh, some were doomed chips. That were only used by like one person. Um, some were chips which took over the world. Some chips had a success and then ended up in gambling machines for the rest of their lives. Right. Um, some chips um, ended up needing support chips, like um, the, the the Yamaha chips that started off the YM two one five one in Marble Madness. Um, 
people realized fairly early on it was pretty rubbish at drums. So the story of a lot of the history of the arcade is them finding different ways to stuff drums onto a onto an FM chip. Um, and Sega had the Sega PCM chip, which is eight, but they had they had a couple of other chips from um, from Oki before that, which could only play one sample at a time. For instance, in Quartet, mm -hmm. which uh, they they had to design the game so it can only play one thing at one time. Later on, um, they 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 were doing they they were having an FM chip which sounded kind of tinkly but, and metallic, but sort of the sound of the arcades. And you had this cr these crunchy rhythm chips. Eventually they realized that they didn't need the FM chips, but you got some wonderful chips somewhere around the late eighties, mid to late eighties that combined um, samples, uh, chip tune for uh, uh, SSG, PSG, you know, square waves sort of thing, et cetera, and um, FM. And so you have you had about twenty two channels of of chip of chip music uh, that you could add together the different synthesis techniques, which led to a really rich sound. Like on uh, the PC ninety eight, uh, PC eighty eight, and PC ninety eight are examples mm. of that. Just got um, to see some of those boxes uh, at the Computer History Museum a couple of weeks ago. It was pretty cool. So growing up with eight bit machines, I was always used to them having a single sound chip, but that wasn't true of the arcade uh, games at all, was it? No, no, it's it's very quite rare. Later on, um, they, they the arcade machines started off with discrete bits of circuitry, one for each sound, like in Space Invaders, uh, where the the only actual sound chip was to do the UFO sound, which was the SN seven six four seven seven. For those of you paying attention, which was a, a kind of a very weird monophonic, semi analog, semi digital chip mm -hmm. that was very difficult to get any music from, but very easy to make squeaky sounds out of. Um, as with most of this stuff, uh, someone later built a synthesizer out of the, the chip. Um, it was also in a fair few children's toys, I think, back in the time, back in the day. Um, being a Texas Instruments chip, it was kind of, it was developed in conjunction with Tato 4 Space Invaders, with, with Space Invaders in mind, but it was sold off the shelf as a wholesale part. Um, so if you if you look at this, uh, if you if you kind of go through this book and, and the first book covers a specific first era of this mm -hmm. and you look at all the chips that you've um, that you come across there. If you would look back in time of which of these chips do you feel like was heavily underutilized for its capabilities it was offering versus which chips were really like maxed out they were just didn't have anything there in other words were were the composers that would work with these uh, either lazy and not or, or or time bound or were some of them just really maxing out what what was available made available to them Hardly anyone was maxing out anything, but the most criminally underused chip was probably the AY38910 family, which started off and was built. It, when it was built, it was built to for a, a computer called the a, a game system called the Gemini Deluxe, which was kind of like a white something that companies called white label, but it it, it became the guts of the Mattel in television. Okay. And that's when most people heard it first. Um, but that same chip was also in the MSX standard, the ZX Spectrum 128 and plus two, I think it's plus two. But anyway, the, Z, the, the ZX, the Amstrad CPC, the Auric. And it wasn't until maybe 1987 or 1988 that people on the Spectrum and the Amstrad started making the most of it using techniques they picked up from the, the composers on the Commodore 64. So Rob Hubbard would do something uh, or Martin Galway would do something and then other people would pick that up and take that to the the, the, the Spectrum chip. Right. Um, so, but before then, when, even when it was used in the arcades, um, it was used in a fairly simple way. Um, like for instance, Gyrus uh, didn't use particularly sophisticated sounds at all, but it had eight of the chips. Right. So it was kind of like absolutely nuts polyphony. Um, um, and um, all driven by uh, uh, Z80. 
Oh, like, that was the other. Th that was the other thing. The the, the um, arcade machines tended to have a separate audio chip, a, 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 a sound chip, and an audio CPU to avoid stressing the main CPU out. Mm. That became very very common, and that was the the Z80 was the um, audio CPU of choice for many years after it stopped being the main CPU in the machine. This, this whole topic area, this feels like you're filling a topic gap that I didn't know existed in books, which is kind of cool because once I heard that, I was like, oh, I need to have that. I never knew that I needed that. Who, who are your target audiences, do you think, for these, uh, these chip books? Um, anyone who's ever listened to arcade machines or home computer thing, uh, computers and wonder it's, how it, it was done. At, it spans at least, but it doesn't span two decades, does it? That range of chips or? Um, well, it does, the book covers 1977 to 2004. Okay. So it's the uh, best part of, well, 30, um, it's uh, 27 years, yep. 20, 27 years, I think. I and it stops. It stops uh, just after the Xbox. Well, it doesn't. It, there, there's a there's a 2004 chip from Yamaha that was interesting, not because it was particularly good, but because it illustrated how difficult it was for manufacturers to find new stuff to do with the chip to justify selling it to manufacturers. In this case, they added the sequencer, which no one needed or wanted or used. Uh, and so how, that, many, how many chips did you cover in this book? Sound chips. Uh, about 90. In, in uh, these books. Fair. In, in, the first book, I think the first book covers uh, 77 to 81. Eh? Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. It, it, which it which leaves... is almost like that. That's, that's like the golden era of arcade. Eh? The most innovation really took place uh, in probably that era for arcade. I don't know. I mean, the, 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 the period from the period from when Marble Madness came out, mm -hmm. um, was also, a, there was a lot of innovation going on. Um, the, not only the FM chips, but the displays got better. But yeah, I mean, for, to go from, to go from um, Seawolf 2 to uh, Commander, or what, well, 1981 gets you to Pac-Man. Pac-Man was absolutely pivotal in, right. um, in, in everything, really. Um, the, the, it was the first time there'd been a chip that could do wavetable synthesis. So it sounded like absolutely nothing else that had ever been heard by human ears. Um, people that people generally didn't hear pure waveforms very often, but they'd heard square waves before, because of that. That's the natural thing for beepers to do, even before they. How do you feel about? Um, obviously, if you look at like an arcade experience, uh, typically these machines would be uh, set up with multiples sound maybe over in by other machines next to it sound uh, especially in the beginning didn't seem to play that much role in an attraction as it did later um you know there's a, there's a couple of uh, you you men uh, you you mentioned gyrus for instance already if that's mm -hmm. just a spectacle if you bump up that sound a little bit on the arcade machine it is like overwhelming almost uh, it's pretty spectacular yeah, uh, it's it, part of that, and part of that, it, it really does add to the gameplay in a spectacular way. I mean, in terms of sound innovation, I think there weren't that many. Um, the the Atari ones were always sounded pretty great because they had po they were stuff with pokies. Yeah, um, the 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 chip that was also in the Atari four hundred eight hundred later on the fifty two hundred. Right, um, that's a great chip. If a bit, if limited, but um, that's another one where, well, the Atari actually used that chip pretty well for sound, and not really at all for music. Hmm. Uh, something like Tron, which used one. Yeah. Um, um, most of the weirdness from that came from the echoing and and um, uh, Wendy Carlos's soundtrack, which was inherently weird by itself. But uh, they did a Atari did a lot of work, and they're one of the first uh, first companies to hire a sa uh, a sound man, pro a proper sound man, which who was Earl C. Vickers, who uh, uh, gave us some reason, uh, some good material and feedback for the book, allowed us to correct a couple of errors. Um, so he came, but he came in 
a little bit after, I think 1982, but before that he was working at Midway. So he had some, uh, he, he had um, a career stretching quite far back. He was the, he was the nearest thing that the computer industry had to a, um, a pioneer for sound. Now, in your sound books, um, I poked around in the drafts a little bit, and um, boy, they look crowdsourced, but they're not. They're you sourced. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know it just looks like an incredible number of people had to work on this. I mean, you you generated all new screenshots from scratch. You um, For every sound chip, you show all kinds of games that uh, the sound chip appeared in. You've taken the time to write some comment about the sound for every single game, and you did this for... Uh, over a thousand games, I think. Yes, uh, well, it's, it's a lot. Uh, no, it's more than that now. It's uh, for each each volume has between three hundred and four hundred games. So yeah. I, I think I think the the entire thing was seventeen hundred games that I had to think of something to say about that was that actually meant something. Although a lot of the time, um, it's quite a zen because sure. the. the I, I kept the comments very short because yeah. I thought uh, what, what I want is for people to have an idea about what to think, but no one's got the patience to read 1,700 densely argued pages of reviews because the, the whole idea of the, the book was you have these um, detailed technical bits and then you have some nice, beautiful pictures to kind of let your brain relax and some nice, easy to read easy to read comments that uh, might be humorous or might be thoughtful or might be factual. Like for, uh, it, it changes, so it's not the same kind of comment. Some of the arcade machines, it tells you which chips did what in the machine, which is an interesting thing to me. I want to know where the drums came from, where the melody came from, whether there was some crossover, whether there was a, the slap bass, what the slap bass was. But on some of the games, like the in, on the Xbox, um, you're commenting more on the musical content or how it suited the game or whether the, whether the compo whether you, whether you know the composer and had a difficult time or uh, thing or whether uh, a particular halo started the craze for choirs in music in, in video game music I'm, I'm convinced of that after halo everything was choirs as far as the eye could see yeah um, so you you've also made all of these games interactive is that something you want to uh, tip your hand on right now or do you want to leave that as a surprise for the readers on how you did that no no that's uh, that's fine um it, it, the, after the first draft of the book i showed it to six people and all six said i really want to hear these these sound chips now this music you've whetted my appetite and um we thought about it and said, okay well what about qr codes and um we were like arguing for uh, uh, about a couple of hours about whether QR codes would mess up the, the design because the design was quite um, uh, quite neat and relaxing and yet vibrant. I didn't do the design so I can say these praises about it. There's a friend of mine called Ian Flory who did a great job on the template which I could then fill up. Um, and so we, we, put the, we put the QR codes in and um, it didn't look too bad. And the payoff was that you could have YouTube video, you could, you could be sitting on the toilet. And this was Martin Galway who said, this is a toilet book. You, you, take this, you take this book into the toilet and sit on the toilet and keep scanning QR codes to listen to chip music. Um, I, 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 think, I think it's a really interesting way to make the book interesting and, and interactive as well. I think... I'm coming back on something you mentioned previously. When you were designing this book and kind of getting some feedback on this, what has become very clear is you're trying to you're trying to appease multiple audiences. There's a lot of little tidbits about individual games in there that are just a fun tidbit about the game. And mm -hmm. what it does, and what I noticed just going through this um, uh, um, book one, is just oh, I want to. I want to kind of re-experience this now. And I want to kind of compare them as well. I, I, somehow I get drawn to comparing titles as well now. And it, it's yeah. really interesting how these pictures combined with some of these music clips really draw you back to a certain period of time in your life 
where you're re-experiencing not just the game but the entire like era it operated in. Very, very interesting. Uh, I think that that was um, definitely the plan. The, the, the plan is that people would have a whole new appreciation for the variety of sounds that were produced in the arcades and in, you know in home computers. They, they would suddenly appreciate why the, the SCC chip in MSX is, sounds so good right. and why. <clears throat> and how did that affect sound in the PC engine, which was a kind of knockoff copy of the chip? And how did that affect... Uh, how, how did that affect Nintendo cartridges? Um, but also, um, um, it was important that people who didn't actually, who weren't actually that interested in the technical bits about the chip, still had a lot of nice pictures to look at and a lot of it, things to experience. And equally, it was important to make the technical stuff rock solid, which, um, uh, thanks to uh, partially to David and uh, Nate, uh, um, it, it was, and uh, uh, some other people who have asked not for credit, <laughs> but they know who they are. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think it's a, a, an interesting point to mention as well because you could you could e you could even go to the to the to the the end uh, the ending of the book almost where it goes way deep, way geeky, way technical. And you could kind of get all absorbed into that and and kind of approach the same topic from a very different spectrum as well, which is I, I think you're um, exposing people perhaps to maybe think about music and and the way that was generated for these machines in a way that they never even thought of. You know, they never thought of like, okay, so that's really what went on inside of this machine to get this music out because for all they knew. You know, it may have been all the same, especially the arcades. A lot of it uh, was uh, custom made. You know, there were only a few mm. titles created with one PCB, and then a completely new uh, design was created, which is fascinating if you think about it. Yeah, it, it, there was another um, another factor, which is that um, is the the narrative of how sound and music progressed across the across the decades, and um, Book one is, is more technical than the other books. It goes into details about waveforms and, uh, and pitch generation and uh, noise resolution and um, uh, uh, noise generators and whatever. And that's partially because the, concentrate, the, the interest in the early chips isn't what the music that was produced, which has a nostalgic value, um, but isn't necessarily something you could listen to forever. But then you start to get chips like the SID and, and uh, the YM2151 as the, and the second volume doesn't have to go into as much detail technically. And by the third volume, you're dealing with combinations of technology that you don't have to explain. So you're saying, oh, if we've got this technology, plus this technology, plus this technology in that chip, and here's why that's interesting. And here's some games which use that really well. Right. And by the fourth, you've basically got people in the studios producing tracks. Um, and the way they're played back is pretty irrelevant. So you've got the same soundtrack appearing on the GameCube, the Xbox, and the PlayStation 2. It's the same audio track. Right. At which point you've, you've gone solidly from technical to artistic. Uh, uh, yeah. But it's the, the 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 journey is both smooth and bumpy, because you can you can tell that the bumps in the road when when FM hit, when wavetable hit, and then when encoding became powerful uh, powerful enough that you could stuff entire um, just red red book was the big thing, red yeah. book and then and then the encoding that the memory became cheap enough so that you could just stuff. Um, Full of full audio tracks into games, uh, whatever. Yeah, I know when I've shown my son some um, graphics from early games like Atari Twenty Six Hundred, um, it, it's a foreign concept to him that you have to sort of use your imagination to figure out what the graphics are supposed to represent. I mean, I just naturally interpret it in the same way. Some of this really early music, the technical music, as you called it you used your imagination to fill those things in. And that's something I don't think modern gamers appreciate either. It was a, it was a different time. Yeah, that went on quite a long time, I think. 
um, at least to the mid 80s, at which point things started to get more suggestive when people started using samples. You know, it, it was a trumpet. It's a bad trumpet, but it's a trumpet. Um, and from then on, uh, using the abstract waveforms was an artistic choice uh, that, that uh, games did, otherwise, uh, within the technical limitations of the, the FM chip, the Yamaha FM chip took over the entire world for the generation of music because it had a lot of voices. They didn't take any CPU time and it was a reasonably programmable set of chips. Um, so it was cheap and it was easy and it generated more no noises than previously. Um, it's, it's kind of like the artificial grape flavored candy, right? Everybody knows it's grape, but it tastes nothing like a grape. You just have to be told that at an early age, and then you know. <laughs> but, I, think that's, I think that's right, yeah. I mean, sorry, bad some, analogy, some, perhaps. <laughs> no, no, it's perfectly, perfectly valid. So um, you did a gigantic survey. I mean, you surveyed, like, almost all of chip music. That is a huge undertaking. I don't know if anybody else has ever really done that before. Um, that's got to help out for future efforts down the road as well, I would imagine. You don't have to tell us what your projects are that are on the back burner. You always have something cooking. But um, that really does seem to position you to branch out into all kinds of directions because, my gosh, what a huge job to survey that many chip tunes on all platforms. Um, the, yeah, the it was, although, although um, a lot of the tunes were chosen by my collaborator, Andrew, who hmm. was much more familiar with the... Uh, much more familiar with a lot of the sound chips than I was. Uh, for instance, he knew uh, the Sam Coupe, he was a big SNES fan, and I'd never had a SNES, so I didn't know where the gems were. Um, and quite a lot of the console uh, things, I relied on him to know which were actually the good tunes. Although when, when I needed some more, I, I would go off and look at what was considered classic by the community. Because yeah. um, I, I really didn't want to impose my own personal tastes on this. If, if something is a classic, but I don't like it, it's still a classic. Well, and and you're, it's... you're touching a really good subject because the, the book reads, um, reads like that. It reads um, uh, from an independent point of view. But obviously, um, we want to hear a little bit about your, your view on this. Uh, you know, that doesn't end up in the book, but we'd like to obviously uh, get a little bit of insight in uh, which are some of uh, Chris's favorites or not so favorites. So I've, I've got a couple of questions on you that may, uh, that may give us some insight in that. And again, the uh -oh. book tries to cover a lot more on the, uh, what did the playing field look like? But we're going to maybe get a little bit of an insight on what uh, what Chris would have been uh, choosing. So if you allow us, uh, I'm going to try and throw a few at you. So let's let's start. What is what is the most terrible game with great music that you've come across? Um, on the Commodore 64, which is where where my heart mostly lies, and. I hesitate to say Jerry the Germ, but I could never play that game. And the, but the music is one of my favourites and one of Rob Hubbard's favourites, even if it's not necessarily regarded as a classic by the scene. Right. Um, there were any number of uh, any number of terrible arcade games that were just, um, but which had great music. Um, I'm struggling to think of many, to be honest. Um, they, they, the arcade games were usually unplayable um, or were just so bland as to be like, ah. right. but then I was never a player. So I've never, I, I was never really a player. Mm. That, that, um, well, that makes sense. And the, the, how about, how about sound effects? Because it, what is interesting, if you read through the first book, a lot of games actually didn't have much music they had a lot of sound effects but it was typically not a lot going on when it came to music no that's right um it, it I, that gets mentioned in the book um for instance when the the sound effects are being put on a separate chip or some separate mm -hmm. channels or something um in general 
when there's music, I would try and comment on the music unless the chip involved was only doing sound effects. Right. Um, so I had something to say about the sound effects. That means the, the same game can appear twice, but with a different write-up. Right. For instance, um, if you talk about OutRun, you mm -hmm. can talk about the music on the YM2151 chip and yeah. the screeches and general other sound effects, applause and stuff on for the Sega PCM chip. Mm -hmm. um, as you say, in, in early days, there, uh, the music tended to be restricted to jingles. So you... Um, so you have to comment on like atmosphere or the technology or what they did. Um, and sometimes you, 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 so few games actually use the chip well that you're reduced that even the notable games are pretty terrible, in which case you just have to say so. But I've, right. tried, not to I've tried not to make the book a downer. There's no point putting things in just to select them off. Oh, no, I, I, I agree. I agree. Sure. Um, but but if you've got if you've got the chip that only had four games released on it and they were all terrible, you you have no choice really, do you? Right. But I assume you got some earworm stuck in your head more than once working on this uh, like Puyon arcade game music or something, right? <laughs> um. <laughs> Fantastic game, by the way. Terrible oh. music. Terrible. The that, game that is, is so cool. That is a very annoying. Uh, Music, wow, yeah. the three of us know what that song sounds like. Oh, this is yeah. Kind of, this is a slick Do not group here. It. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think one of the things, um, one of the one of the interesting side things was finding out where some of the annoying tunes come from, like uh, um, Amadar, which came from a, a Japanese TV program, um, Adventure on Goiton Island or something, and uh, Frogger coming from, uh, the main Frogger theme coming from a children's cartoon. And not even an obscure one. So all the Japanese people who heard Frogger knew exactly where it came from, but no one in the West did. And um, the the real versions are marginally less annoying, but only marginally. You know, in this, um, I've, I've I've dealt a lot with uh, arcade, and one of the things that I um, always am in awe about is that both Stern and Williams, for the short period of time that both of them were in video coin-up, um, made a real big effort to uh, also output the sound of the chips in a proper way. If you really look at some of these arcades and the way they were built, physically built, they had mm -hmm. very tinsy sounding uh, speakers in that. Not by Stern, not by... Uh, Williams, they had big fat speakers in them, really rich sound, and they really made the most out of uh, the sound that came out of the chips that were installed. It's always fascinated me that it really was those two sta as standouts in the uh, early uh, coin up days. Yeah, I, I got I to gotta second that on the Williams games. They had those unique um, fat rich sound right. effects, the, the, the um, Defender, the Robotrons, those, all oh those kinds goodness. of things. Yeah, that, that's shit, childhood yeah. sound effects right there. Also, their, um, their speech chip, the HC55516, emulation does it no justice whatsoever. I, it was, it was a pure analog more. chip. Yeah, could you have a analog chip, hand yeah. handcrafted? I, I say in the book, yeah. and um, that was in use for so many years. It was a, a, only monophonic, um, but um, it was the the quality was so good so early. That's nineteen seventy nine that that came out. That's just insane, insanely good speech. Um, you've got like Berserk using the other yeah. kind of speech. Yeah. Um, and the Williams one was just so um, amazing. But, uh, you know, uh, I, Space Invaders, when I looked at, I had to look at the, the cabinet schematics at some point, and I noticed they put the bass speaker that did the dum 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 right next yeah. to the player's groin, <laughs> which I thought, you know, I, I wondered if they did that on purpose just to get more coins. Especially when they go right on your genitals, especially when you're young. I, think, yeah. I don't know why I'm excited, but I'm excited. Yes, it's 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 amazing. Now, a lot of these um, a lot of these games, basically, you know, due to um, the arcade, were you know then recoded for uh, for other platforms, uh, ported to other platforms. Mm -hmm. um, 
in your book, you touch on several of them. Wait, wait, where do you feel that um, some of the uh, ports that were made of, of the music, not of the game, but of the music were actually more successful than they were on the original and, and why? The FM chips that we used in the mid 80s arcade games, um, Atari programmed them really well. Mm -hmm. Atari did, did some great stuff with them, but most of the, the, the most of the games that were using them, like Data East or you know the Sly Spy or whatever, um, the actual sounds are quite twangy. Mm -hmm. And if if you listen to the mod from Maimon speakers, you can hear they were borderline unpleasant. Right. Um, so what they had what they had going for them is an extra drum chip and more voices. Um, when they were ported, um, where they didn't change the entire melody to just uh, like in Ghosts and Goblins, for instance, yeah. um, uh, on the 64, um, or whatever Tim Follin was doing um, with Bionic Commando, um, people were struggling to, cr well, they were, they were cramming it all in onto analog uh, analog analog e chips and um that was an interesting creative process uh, so some things survived it some things didn't um but in general the the original tunes tended to be quite whiny and or clangy mm -hmm. so some of them benefited greatly from being done just with abstract square waves or sawtooths or, or whatever um so things like bionic commando just ended up majorly better because they were in the hands of a genius like Tim Follin. Um, something like Commando, Rob Hubbard took the original theme, just remixed the hell out of it mm -hmm. uh, until it was funk. Um, where, where there was a straight port, it tended to end up disappointing if you had a chip that had eight voices being squashed into a machine that had three, especially as the home machines had to play the sound effects and the um the tune at the same time right and that's right. A, very, a great limitation on the voices so you tended to have bits of the music yep. drop out unless they just left the only converted the title tune and just left all the in games out right um i, I was reading recently about a game where that, that's what they that's what they did when, I think when Rob Hubbard converted the Trojan music, he only converted the title tune. Mm -hmm. um, but there were lots of other tunes in the game, an insane number of tunes in some of the games. Absolutely insane. Um, so it, it generally depended on who was doing the converting, how much creative freedom they had. But it was always um, a quart into a pint pot. Now, you've been doing a great amount of remixing in this past, uh, what is it, 20 plus years. When, when creating this book or these books uh, and your famous Back in Time series, some of the other series that you've been publishing, have you started making a new list of games and music uh, that you got exposed to as part of writing this book that you now put on a list of, hey, I want to do a remix on these? Uh, maybe Streets of Rage 2 and um, I already did so uh, part of the uh, an arcade volume uh, arcade classics volume 2 that has uh, um, the road the tunes from Roadrunner the classical tunes from Roadrunner done in a really nuts way and uh, a version of um, Gradius a suite from Gradius is oh, actually Gradius. Uh, uh, came out of that and is going to Prague in February so there's a full orchestral arrangement of that now Oh, fantastic! Um, I also did Paperboy and uh, a version of a version of Gyrus that cuts all the subtunes together to make it more coherent and gives it a structure. Um, that's done, but not. Uh, I, I kind of diverted to the book before I had a chance to go back and finish Volume Two. So, um, and I have. This is I have just. Promised. I I I am. I I got to say, Chris. I am just. I'm. I'm so surprised. I'm so surprised how this book just triggers so many memories of so many things that I'd forgotten and how the combination of having some of these tunes 
connect them back to a game because I had the tune. I could not tell you where it came from. And some of the pictures connect me back to the tune. I really think that that combination in the book is a really, uh, it's a really fun combination of re-exploring what you may or may not know. Uh, I think it's so. It's really wonderful how that's been done. And it, it gets better as the volumes go on, in a sense, because the because the tunes become more worthy. And right. uh, that you, I mean, so for instance, um, Paper Mario Thousand Year Door, that's many hours of music. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, the, the YouTube has playlists, so you can link to those. Um, but the, the tune, the, some of the amount, the amount of music they were packing into these things, like Diddy Kong on the Nintendo 64, Right. tons of music i mean once you get to volume three you could be listening to all the tunes in there like say 300 games you could be listening for weeks yeah uh, in volume one most of the tunes are small or oh. or you or basically you're watching a long play of the gameplay in order to experience what you experience right. later later on we're doing more linking to playlists of the audio so that people can say all oh, right yeah there's all these tracks um, and sort of um, instead of having a long play, m most of the Commodore ones I think are long play. But when by the time you get to the Xbox, there's really very little point in doing a long play. Right. When you when you can do an OST. Right. But I I do feel I, I do feel hey, uh, book one is going to be available soon. Eh? I think it, or is it it's available a, now? How about you? It's available from my website and PDF. And okay. It's, it's on it. It's just on its way back from being printed in Spain, so okay. it will be shipped, I, I, shipped out I, shortly. Right, and I, I think people should read it in sequence. I, I, I think know so. there's going to be a generation that's more, you know, more in tune with maybe uh, the uh, systems that come up in book three or four. But like you said, it's like building up almost your uh, your appetite and your theoretical knowledge that oh. will make you appreciate the other volumes better. Yeah, vol volume one is going to cover a lot of VIC-20 stuff, which definitely will resonate with the crowd that's here. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, making them chronologically ordered was by far the best organizational principle you could have put that in. Yeah. Um, can I show an example of the barcodes? I printed something out of my printer. I don't know if it'll show on the screen or not. So this is just a picture of a typical page. You have a, you know, a game there. You have description. You got a barcode. You have another game other barcode and quite literally you just click your phone and listen as you go through the book that is i know he said this already but it's very cool and it's for me it was the right balance of nostalgia and discovering new things as well which is um which is always fun uh, and for the pdf um the the qr codes are also proper hyperlinks so you don't even have to scan with your phone Ooh. you yeah, can just click sense. on the, click on the click on the qr code and go to it so go straight there um but yeah, it's there. There, there is a, a combination of famous stuff, good stuff, and obscure stuff. I, I think and that's really cool. Can I? Uh, can we do a couple more to kind of see and test uh, your knowledge of the fifty million uh, tunes and sound effects that you've heard right now, and kind of set some games off against each other? Just you know to demonstrate how much time you've been spending in this and uh, how far <laughs> you took this topic. I think. Uh, let me let me try something. Dig Dug or uh, Rock and Roll? Um, well, rock and Roll has better music. The, I, the music with Dig Dug, the, the thing I found interesting about Dig Dug was the music stops when you stop moving. Right. And that's that's because of the limitations of the sound chip. They couldn't do sound effects and music. Now that well, I would have never guessed. So that was not a design. It was a technical limitation. Well, no, it was a design, but it was designed around a limitation. They, they didn't want to have... Genius. That's interesting. Um, that is genius. It's it's very strange. It's it's kind of like using the it, the music steps forward as you do. It's um, a very interesting. I've never seen that replicated anywhere else, apart from some of the weird, more weird musical games like, say, Master of the Lamps. Oh, that was an uh, interesting game as well. Very interesting sound uh, use in that game. That definitely was hypnotic. A, a classic, yeah. Yeah. A classic. So um, um, 
Yep, and I'm focusing on book one, people, because book one is going to be available. So I'm focusing on on book one. They got, we got we got more time. We got more events coming up. We'll see if we can lure you back on stage uh, for the <laughs> other books. Uh, Scramble the 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 bubble sound. How does that sound? I remember that in a certain way. Remember how that that bubble sound sounds like the weirdest sound that they created in Scramble. Probably, because it actually yeah. sounds like bubbles, but I, I could never figure out how they got to it. Well, they did, did some decent work there, but it's only a square wave with a pitch modification. Uh, so, yeah, but they, they obviously put the time in there. Yeah, yeah, it would, yeah. I remember that as a true standout of how realistic that sounded. Um, mm -hmm. I um, can you, tell us something about Captain Blood, if you can. That had a ripoff of uh, Jean Michel Jarre's uh, music. Zoo, yeah, zoology. I think it was. Yeah. The, the interesting thing there was, it wasn't the straight zoology. It was a, a bit. Someone had chopped up zoology. Yeah. Remixed all the bits together, and then put it in the Amiga and ST game, which was fine. But then someone tried to do a SID of that, and for, for and an AY of that for the Amstrad and Spectrum. And it came out sounding absolutely nothing like zoology at all, even though Jean Michel was still credited as the composer yeah. i found that well when i first heard it i was like i was like, racking my brains because i know zoo look reasonably well and i was racking my brains said where on earth is this from so it had been chopped up so much that when you abstracted it from the sounds he'd used it sounded unrecognizable and didn't get reviewed well as well people were like what's this the um Hey, David, you just chip in whenever, eh? but uh, the um, the Atari Golden Era on the same platform for sound. Gauntlet, Paperboy, 720, ABP, there's probably four or five titles I'm missing here. Which Two one bit. do you believe, uh, which one do you believe had the best implementation of uh, sound in, uh, in, that, in that particular PCB range? We have we got a mute here? No, you're 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 there. You're oh, was there. that me? Was that? Yeah, it was for me? you. I thought, yeah, sorry. I thought that was for David. No, no. All sorry. right. Well, I, 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 yeah, absolutely. You're happy to hear David. Oh, fair. Oh. <laughs> um, you've got to you've got to hand it to Crystal Castle. So, sorry to um to Marble Madness. I think that they uh, uh, when Atari got the YM two one five one, they managed mm -hmm. to wrangle a one year exclusivity agreement out of Yamaha. Yeah. Yeah. So they were the only people who were using it. And they just like experimented and poked it for, for a month or two until they came up with the weirdest sounds. And some of the sounds they came up with were kind of defined the way that chip sounded for the rest of its life. Mm -hmm. They were essentially creating the default patch set, especially the, the synth brass and stuff. So that, that was, um, that was uh, influential. Um, 720 did a great job of pretending to be heavy metal using climbing chips. Yes, yes. And that was nice. the, the same chip. Um, um, they were the two, they were the two biggies for me. I mean, the, the, the YM2151 was also an outrun. So, yeah. Um, that did a, it did a lot of work there. Yeah. But that had, but that had the help of the drums, which weren't from that chip. Oh, where did um, they come from? Uh, Sega PCM chip as well. So that was a separate chip there. Yeah, so there was the Sega PCM, which did the audience noise, the screeches, and the um, the drums. Mm -hmm. uh, after After Burner went nuts on that because that After Burner uh, stuck the the big tom toms and the slap bass on the PCM uh, chip, and then had everything else played by the FM. Remove the in MAME, you can actually turn these sound chips up and down mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. volume to see what they, each one is doing, which I highly recommend um, as, a, as an activity because it's a lot of fun. Um, and if you turn down, play the afterburner music without the PCM, Sega PCM chip, it sounds so neutered. Outrun doesn't. Outrun can survive without the, uh, the, without the drums, although it sounds right. better with them. Right. Um, that's got such catchy tunes as well. I think I think that one just from a musical composition is uh, people are just attracted to that uh, still today. 
even yeah. on, on poor uh, on, even on poor chip implementations. Yeah, I think so. The, the the SID versions of two of the tunes weren't that great, but they still got praised at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, at the time they weren't that praised, but the, there's a halo effect over time on the outrun tunes. So uh, people should search out my versions of the tunes on Spotify. There. Uh, my remixes of them they're very very authentic now gyrus came up previously yeah that was something mm -hmm. about gyrus one of my well, favorite games that i think as uh, the sound and play integration is very well done i think if you were to pick one game that actually absolutely like redefined what you should expect from arcade machines it was gyrus i mean for, for start sticking eight chips in it <coughs> that is fucking insane yeah um and in stereo i mean no what not yeah. the yeah i mean the so many speakers and of course the idea of um tarting up a dramatic classical piece in such a, a a unique way most of the there were a lot of classical pieces being done but they were mostly played straight or played with just a couple of voices or whatever Jairus is the first one that took it spun it and you know, used Sky obviously for uh, inspiration, but it was uh, inspired. And whatever platform Gyrus ended up on, it ended up setting new standards. On the yeah. Commodore 64, it set new standards before yeah. people like Rob Hubbard turned up. On the Coleco Vision, it set new standards as well. Chris, why do you think that was the case? Because that is one of the few games that truly did that across all por uh, uh, ported platforms. Um. I think it's just the combina magical combination of the music and um, the arrangement, really. And the fact that it would, the arrangement was sufficiently clever that you could cut it down and you still didn't lose any of the spirit of the tune. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, for instance, um, uh, the, the C64 version added the drums, I think. Right. I'm not entirely sure that the arcade machine had drums. Or you could take the drums away for the Coleco version or the 2600 and you'd still have a decent... Right. stab at it plus whoever was doing the, the porting did a usually did a pretty good job they right. like must they must have only had the responsibility and the music was a large part of the game right so i i've written down here batman the movie which one had the best sound which platform um they had they all had very different soundtracks which was right great. yeah they were like really different they got like, um, it's like everybody got to do whatever they wanted. I think the the the, the NES Batman, I mean the Game Boy Batman is highly regarded, uh, um, even though that's a lot funkier than the movie. Um, the C sixty four one is regarded as a bit of a classic. The NES one is regarded as a classic. I, I think um, it's generally wherever it showed up, it actually made an impression. Yeah. Not as much as Gyrus, obviously, but. Right. There was a there, there, it, pretty fine jobs were done across the board, um, with completely different composers and completely different results. So, what is the status of the book or books? Um, is, it, is it is it just ready to print or the PDF? The PDFs are all of the PDFs are ready to print, but um, uh, there's a fundraising process that gets them to be printed and the first one is coming back from that process in the next week or two um, okay. at which point it, 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 the pre-orders will start getting sent out and then we can dust off volume two with the sid and the amiga and uh, the ym2151 and um, then start fundraising to send that to the printers etc sure now you may have uh, answered this when yuri asked earlier i can't remember but how do people find uh, volume one where do they go um there is a link in uh, they, they have fusion retro books for the hardback and c64audio.com for the, the pdf okay the, yeah, there's so a plan fusion retro books.com for, for um I, I i'm not sure i've, I've put a link into into yeah, it's my, a dot com. Um, yeah fusion retro books.com it's on the discord as well and we'll make sure that uh, we get that repeated as well but if you just search for uh, search for the little book of sound chips i'm sure it'll come up on google because no one else has done one the nice thing is when you've got all four volumes you can put a slipcase on them and call them little cube of sound chips 
Uh, you better be, eat some uh, oatmeal uh, the next uh, few months because you're going to need uh, a little bit of power to lift that thing up. While it may be uh, little, it is actually quite the volume. <laughs> well, at least I finished it because now I'm now I've moved on to uh, finishing off the book about Rob Hubbard, which is um, uh, it, it's different again because that's uh, looking in depth at a particular person and uh, but mostly the music. And uh, that's a different, a different research, different research type entirely. Right, right. So I think we have a hard end in about three minutes. Is there any questions you wish we would have asked you so you could show off more? No, I think I've showed off already. Probably. Okay. You, you could you could ask me if I'm interested in hiring any uh, world class London orchestras in, in the near future. I so say, well, I'm planning that. I'm planning that, but uh, they're very very slow getting back to us. But that's something that we may get to enjoy at some point in time. I'm absolutely sure of it. That is awesome. Chris, you know, it is... Uh, oh, I have one more question. I can't let you go without that one. Berserk or Wizard of War? Wizard of War. Tell us um, why. There's a lot more speech and the music is better. The music drives you nuts, though, doesn't it? Well, at least there's some. <laughs> but it's, it's just... It's just um, it's just really creepy it is and that, wor that, that works in the, the yeah and is. um and it's a sassy game i like sassy games yeah i mean berserk was sassy okay coins in pocket whatever but wizard of war brought insulting the player to a, a whole new level until then gorf yeah. took it to and i was surprised gorf doesn't have a little arm that sticks out and sticks up to a finger at you right it was okay. chris uh the book as as uh as it stands right now, you know, it's just awesome. For those people, Thank you know, you. go click that <laughs> link, check it out. It is a visual spectacle. There's all kinds of fun uh, trivia in there. It's uh, whether you like music or a technical person, or you just want to get some, some funny one-liners on things, it's all in there. It really is. You did a bang on job on this one. It's really, really nice. And it's a, personally, a very fantastic era of uh, music as well, book one, and it's only going to go up. Uh, book book two, guys, is going to cover C64. It's and Amiga. Be... And the Amiga. And the yeah, Amiga. I, I, had a, I had a lot of help, but I, I'm, I'm hoping that people won't ever look at arcade cabinets in the same way again. Oh, I, I, I'm confident of that. And I've, I, I've been exposed to many, many arcades uh, and, and arcade cabinets deep down. And I, I even I'm starting to look with different eyes and ears to them again. So <laughs> really, really good job there, Chris. It was, again, a big, big pleasure to have you on. Um, nice to be we're here. We're going to pencil in a date for next year again um, nice. um, and try and see if we can get you on. Excited for more news and more projects from you. Excellent. I'll be there. Thanks for the no notice, no agenda talk. That was great. Nice. Yeah, Thank fantastic. you very much, everybody. Thanks, now do Chris. I cut myself off? All right. Back <laughs> to you, Jim. Oh, okay. So you're, you got me here still? I do. Yeah. Okay. We can hear you loud well, that was the most depressing and yet enlightening interview ever. You reckon? I, yeah, I, I realize that i miss all those games <laughs> i know i, did, I know, I didn't it, know. It's just, this has been <laughs> i'm telling you this is it's it's truly amazing what chris has yeah put it's, together it's, here. it's it crazy like so much fun and it, it just you know the test there just i had some random questions he picked some up it is just yeah i mean incredible. obviously he's, he's absolutely a gazillion hours doing this yeah so i mean when you're asking about certain games and like i I know exactly where I was when I saw that game for the very first time. I was like, oh, you know, it's like Space Harrier or, you know, Afterburner, whatever. I remember one time I was playing Afterburner inverted at Disneyland because they had the huge spinning one. Oh, yeah. 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 So I remember playing that one there. So I was like, geez. And then every time he mentioned something, I'm like, well, I know that, 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 that. It's like, wow, I am a nerd. <laughs> apparently it's, it's just i want to turn on the arcades i may need to turn on an arcade later today just to uh, have right, it fired up on it uh, your yeah. t-shirt's getting that startup music stuck in my head right now oh i know <laughs> and i always hear in the back of my head when i wear the shirt the um the level up when you get to, to ten thousand. 
Yeah. So you get your extra guy. I'm like, oh. Yeah, they will sit there. Yeah, I was immediately regretting when I said the most the terrible games with great music. I wanted that because I didn't dare to ask great game with terrible music because I knew they would be stuck in my head all night again. So right, I didn't right. Ask them that question. There's a too many of those games. So, but you know, I, I mean, the the fact that you know that there's games with terrible music and vice versa, and the reason why they're stuck in your head is because somewhere somehow we all like those things, anyways. You know. Yeah. So yeah. it's like. It's Good amazing. Gameplay. I'm just I'm just in awe on how many projects Chris pumps out. He is just working on so many different things, and it's not like oh, I'm doing this small project here. Now here I come with a volume one, almost 400 pages of meticulously created. Yeah, that's it is that's nuts. It's nuts. It's you, nuts. He's a machine. One, two, three, and four. He's, He's like a thousands machine. of pages to, potentially. Yeah, it's it's many thousand. It's it's a four volume book. It is yeah. a lot of pages, a lot of work. Um, That's a lot of QR codes. Yeah, he's yeah. got this little reality portion <laughs> field that that sucks people in to help him out with these impossible. That's projects. very much so. I know. I know you and and uh, and Doctor Knapp uh, spent time on it. Nate, <laughs> Nate did countless hours. I mean, that's where I got hours of proofreading as well. This marionette, this three-headed dragon that came from Prague when I fly out there to watch him record symphony of right. yeah. tunes. I mean, yeah. who does this? Um, yeah. Abbott does and then the little this. tidbit that we got out of that as well, David, on what he's working on right now with the London Orchestra. Yeah, London Symphony Orchestra, that's a big deal. Um, now that would be, that how deal. cool would that be? And he's already made the first contacts with, I remember he was on Radio 4, he was on the BBC, uh, BBC Tally as well. He's yeah. going to it is now is the time there's so many people and i i am truly hoping that some of the uh some of the classics that out of the books you know maybe great candidates for me remix as well this is it's just awesome this is awesome yeah. well i'd like to thank both of you because this was a filler at last minute literally and uh what a filler it was i mean well you, you know the funny thing <laughs> is uh, a, a month and a half ago uh, David and I spoke about this and I said, I would love, I would love to get Chris on again. And at that moment in time, I didn't realize that last time we spoke to him was actually on the Canadian event. And, and David said, we'll be I got, yeah, I got we'll a lot of projects going on right now. I said, but still, you know, and David, I got to give it to you, man. I, a, you've got all your projects that you've been trying to finish off. Then yesterday, your voice went, or the day before yesterday, your voice went totally down. Oh, yeah, I trashed and you, my voice. And despite that, you didn't want to have me see all tear up. And then Chris, who was gracious <laughs> enough to step in immediately. I don't think it took 10 minutes for him to respond and say, oh, sure, I'm up for this. It was just, this was... Yeah, he answered every question. I was about ready to say, you know, how do you open the jewel and crusted egg in Zork One or something <laughs> just to hear him not be able to answer a question? But yeah, he there was no uh, uh, like uh, nothing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely <laughs> awesome. All right, well, guys, uh, Yuri, if you'll hand back the controls yeah. to me so I can uh, yeah uh, go to um, Slay Radio. The next the uh, presentation is going to be um, Rodolfo. It's okay. going to show us how to do a Pi Amiga, and that's going to be at 4.30. So we're going to go to Slay Radio during the meantime, and uh, we'll be back in, what, 25 minutes or so? Okay. I think you're your host again? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. All right, guys. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. That was awesome. We'll see you um, in a little bit. You need to make sure you get Chris for next year live. Oh, for sure. This he will awesome. be doing something else to report on. So, yes. Right. Live event, Las Vegas. I'll be there. Yes. Yeah, See you in a little good. bit. Enjoy All the right. show. All right. Bye. See ya.